mic too.
Good morning and welcome to the temple. We're going to start with Lift High the Cross on page 159. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand and join us in song. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to the temple. We're so glad that you're here today. A couple of announcements. One is VBS, our Vacation Bible School, is right around the corner. And if you would like to volunteer, how many of y'all love uh, VBS? How many of y'all love having kids at V? Okay. Oh, good. Well, now that you got your hands raised, uh, if you'd like to volunteer, you can do so. And uh, we would love for you to do that. You can volunteer actually at the next step table outside these doors onto the right can sign up for that. Also, our Family Mission Week is going to be coming up fairly soon, and this is a very special time where we get out into our community. We've been doing this. This will be our third year doing this now, and um, it's been a great experience. Uh, we started this during COVID when everything kind of shut down, and we started going out. We said, we're going to do this as a, as a congregation. We're going to pursue this as our own uh, mission trip within our community, to serve our community, to be visible in our community. And so uh, it's been a wonderful thing. We started off with 80 or 90 in the first year. We had about 130, 140 last year. We hope to really 
boost it up and go to 200 this year and, and really make a great, great uh, splash out in our community, helping people build wheelchair ramps. We, we, uh, we uh, put up drywall in a garage home that someone needed and, and helped them with their shower and, and, and all kinds of things with running water. It was an amazing, amazing year. And so we just want to keep continuing to build on that year after year after year. If you'd like to help with that, there's opportunities all over the place. You don't have to be out in the heat. Uh, there are things here at the church that can be done as well. And so you can volunteer at the Next Step table uh, between now and then. Just uh, You can sign up and we can uh, share with you a few places to, to be able to volunteer. And you can look at where you would like to fit in. Well, this is a great day. We always celebrate something. And this uh, week is is no different. We had an absolutely wonderful end to our uh, midweek. Our midweek semester ended, and we had so many volunteers with teachers and people in the kitchen and all the folks that clean up and everything. And we just want to thank God for them. Can we thank God for a great midweek? All the folks who really made it work, thank you for that. It's a good thing. Also, I wanted to make a special announcement uh, this morning because this is important that we uh, uh, reveal what has uh, happened. We voted this week as a church uh, on our affiliation, and uh, we voted by a, uh, no, a margin of 95.5% to go with the Foundry Network of Churches. And so this is a, a network of like-minded churches that we will uh, this week begin to begin our association with, get our paperwork to. Uh, and this helps us as a church to be able to connect in um, they, they have the same mission that we do and we can learn from them and sometimes they might even be able to learn a thing or two from us um, but we'll be able to grow as iron sharpens iron as the Bible says and we'll be able to uh, exchange best practices and, and that sort of thing and really learn how to build God's kingdom even in greater ways so I really hope that you um, uh, continue to pray for us in that it's a great opportunity and great experience. Let's pray together and let's thank the Lord. If you would like to give your tithes and offerings, you can give so, do so in the bu- buckets on the way out, um, or you can give online at templeonline.org. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We honor you today. We know, oh God, that you have brought us this far. We thank you for the gifts and, the, and what has been given. We ask God that you would continue to bless us, strengthen us, and encourage us. Lord, you brought us out of Egypt and you brought us through the wilderness. And I thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to take us over the Jordan and into this new land that you've called us to. And I ask God that you would, as, as you were with us then, you are with us now and you're going to be continued to be with us in the future. And you are guiding and directing us every step of the way. Lord, we want to conquer new land for you, to build your kingdom so that souls will come to you. People will know you, know Jesus is their Lord and their Savior. That's our mission. That's our goal. And ultimately, that's what we're about as a church. And so, Father, I thank you for that. And I ask that you would guide us in our affiliation, guide us in our future. In Jesus' holy and wonderful name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen.
That was the handbell grand finale for the year, so we need to give them an extra hand, Robin, for her direction and the dedicated crew she has here. Thank you all. If you will, turn into your hymnals, hymn number 462. Is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. that God is a God who hears us. He is our Father, and when we pray to Him, He responds as a good Father would. And so He is more eager to hear us pray than sometimes we are willing to pray. And so let's go to Him now. Father God, we come before You this morning, and we are thanking You for the blessings of this life. But more importantly, we thank You for who You are, that You are worthy of all glory and majesty and honor and power, that your strength is abundant, that your love is overflowing, and that your faithfulness to us is truly amazing. Thank you, God, for the way in which you have sent Jesus to die on a cross for us, for our sins, so that we might be washed in the blood of the Lamb, so that we might be forgiven of our sins and so that through the waters of baptism we are cleansed and made new we are brought new regenerated into a new life in Christ Jesus our Lord and Lord that you have set us free from the bondage of sin you walk with us through the power of your Holy Spirit and you promise us a heaven that is full of life and hope and peace we thank you, O oh God, in the midst of this world that we can look to you. We pray for those that are struggling around the world today and those that struggle near us, our family, our friends, those who are in our community. Father, we ask that you would be near them. Send us out to alleviate their suffering. Help us to be a friend, to be a neighbor, to be a family member who loves them and cares about them who seeks them out and who walks into the midst of their mess and helps lead them to the message of Jesus. We thank you, God, for everything that you have done. And Lord, would you teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you. Wow, that's great. I can just see hear old Uncle B. Rose in the back row going, Amen. Good singing. Bless his heart. <laughs> Thank you all. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Debbie. On, on bass and banjo. That's great. Would you stand one more time for the reading of God's Word from Psalm 73? Psalm 73, the Psalm of Asaph. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. But my feet were slipping, and I, I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like the other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil, and in their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all of their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning we're dealing with the question, why do bad things happen to people? Why do bad things happen? That's a tough question. In fact, I would say that's not just a tough question, it's the tough question. It's the tough question that has confounded philosophers and theologians and pastors and people who are hurting and people like you and me for generations. And you're familiar with this question if you've lived any amount of time. You've asked that question, why did my parents get divorced? Or why did I lose my job? Or why did my loved one pass away? Or why did, did my spouse betray me? You've asked that question if you've ever asked, God, why can't you take away this cancer or this, these migraines? Or why can't you take away this mental illness, this depression? You've asked this question in one form or another when you've looked around at the world and the way it is and say, God, why are all these children starving? Why is war tearing people apart? Why is there so much suffering that we see in the world? You're familiar with this question. We all are. And so as we continue our series called Big Questions, where we're working our way through some of these types of questions that have confounded humanity, I would submit to you that it's a question that's been asked since the beginning of time. 300 years before Jesus came to earth, before he was born, the philosopher Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, actually wrestled with this particular question, and he, and he came to this terrifying conclusion. He said, if God is, is not able to prevent evil, then he must not be all-powerful. If God is not willing to prevent evil, then he must not be all-good. If God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil still exist? This is an argument, by the way, that is repeated over and over again in modern uh, books like the, atheist, the, the atheists, the New Atheist Movement have put out this same kind of argument. And I would submit to you that this, this question has shipwrecked a lot of people in their faith and in their life. And honestly, a lot of well-meaning Christians have answered this question with some pretty stupid answers. You probably heard it. You probably heard somebody say something simplistic like, well, you know, it's just God's will. It, it, who are you to question God's will? He's the creator and you're the creation. Who are you? You just need to accept it. Or maybe you've been told something like this. Well, if you had enough faith, if you just had enough faith, then this person would be healed. Or, or maybe you've been told, well, you know, 
you're getting what you asked for. I mean, God's paying you back. Maybe you've been told those things. Or, or maybe you've heard when a child dies, well, you know, God just needs another angel to pour out the rain. Or your husband or your spouse, your, your wife passes away and they say, well, you know, God needed them more in heaven than you need them on earth. To which we all respond, really? God needed my child? By the way, we don't become angels. That's a sermon for another day, but that would actually be a demotion. But just so you know, we don't become angels. But God needed my child to pour out the rain. God doesn't have an angel, legions of angels to do that. God needed my husband more than I needed them. God needed my wife more than I needed them. And see, I believe that sometimes because of these bad answers that the church, Christians, well-meaning Christians, trying to be helpful, have made more atheists by the bad answers that we've given to this question. It's a question, honestly, that we wrestle with. And so let me just say up front, there are no easy answers to this question. And I am by no means going to be able to answer every question that you have when it comes to why do bad things happen. But let me just say this. Let me start off by saying that if the answer to human suffering is that there is no God, then where is the hope in all of that? If the answer to human suffering is that there there is no God, then then, then what good does that actually do to help somebody? Years ago in the 1960s, there was a prominent, quote-unquote, theologian, philosopher at the Emory University Candler School of Theology. I put him in quotes, his name was Dr. Thomas Altizer, and he came up with the, the theory that God is dead. This is a Methodist seminary. He was teaching this. And Dr. E. Stanley Jones, who was a famous Methodist missionary to India, came to visit and came to speak at this seminary, and, and he talked to Dr. Altizer and he said, Dr. Altizer, where did you get this idea that God is dead? And Dr. Altizer said, oh, I got it from Nietzsche. And, and Jones inwardly gasped. He said, Nietzsche? Nietzsche lived in and out of insane asylums for most of his life and died in an insane asylum. He said, we got a theology from an insane asylum. And he said, well, Dr. Altizer, are you able to help people with this idea of God is dead? He said, oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm a theologian. And Dr. Jones says, really? A theologian of what? A God that's dead? You're not a theologian. You're a mortician. He said, you know, so often people have brought this to be that God is dead. How does it help with that? Think about it. If you're a Christian and you believe that God exists and that God is good, then at least, at the very least, if you're going through suffering, you can believe that even though I don't understand it and even though I'm confused by it and even though I'm angry about it, at least I know that there is a plan, there is a purpose, there is something beyond this. There is a reason for why this is happening. And that, that beyond this, even beyond my understanding, that God can bring good out of something that is so wrong and so awful and so evil. That in the midst of my pain, there is a purpose. At least I can hold on to that if I believe that there's a God. But if there's no God, then our suffering is meaningless. Our suffering, suffering is purposelessness. And so it is what it is. And so I can't think of a, a worse thing to say to someone in pain and suffering to say, well... Sorry, it just is what it is. It leads to nothing. It's meaningless. Nothing good can come out of it. But see, I believe that the truth is, as I said in my Easter message, I believe the truth is, is the presence of evil and suffering in this world proves that God exists. Because how in the world do we know that something is evil? How do we know that something is right? How do we know that something is wrong? How do we know that something is good or bad? If it doesn't come from God, how do we know that, that this comes from, this got to come from somewhere? Like I, I gave the example in the earlier services. I said, I want to imagine if I took this piece of pipe and I started beating you over the head with it. And you said, stop, don't beat me over the head with the pipe. And I said, why? 
And you said, well, Phil, it's wrong. And I'd ask you, why is it wrong? Well, because I say it's wrong. Because it is wrong. And I'd say, no, I think it's perfectly right to beat you over the head with this pipe. And you say, but Phil, the universe, the universe is not in your corner on this. The universe has said this is wrong. And I say, my universe told me that you need to have your head beat over. And you say, but Phil, humanity, collectively, we as a society, as civilization, has decided that beating people over the head with a pipe is bad. And I'd say, I didn't get a vote in that. I don't agree. I think beating you over the head with this pipe is a good thing. You see, my first point is this. If there is no God, then there is no moral point of reference. And if there's no moral point of reference, then who says what is happening to us is right or wrong? And that causes a bit of a problem, doesn't it? It's a bit of an issue, isn't it? And so as we look at this issue, we can't just say that the presence of, of evil and suffering in the world means that the absence of God. Because where does the idea of evil come from? Where does our concept of evil, where, where does our knowledge of that this is wrong, when we look at the world and we say, that's not right that children should suffer? Why shouldn't we be like Ebenezer Scrooge and just say, well, it reduces the surplus population? Where is it within us that says something is wrong? It comes from God. It comes from God. That's who, it's the image of God that has been placed upon our heart. It's the fingerprint of God, the imagio dei. God's fingerprint is upon your soul, which says to you, there is something in you that says, this is not right. This is evil. The world shouldn't be like this. And so why? What, what's the answer to why? Well, let me give you the theological answer first. And that's my second point. If love is a choice, then suffering is a possibility. You see, the only way that love is possible is if there's a choice to love. Otherwise, you're programmed to just do things. And if you're programmed to do things, then that's not really love. If I, if I was programmed that every day at 5 o'clock, I was to bring Dana flowers. I was to swing my market basket at 445, and at exactly 5 o'clock on the dot, I was to walk in with the same set of flowers and give her these flowers at exactly 5 p.m. on the dot, okay? And I walked in every day, gave her the flowers and said, here are your flowers, very robotic voice, by the way. Here are your flowers. I am programmed to give them to you. I love you. Let me ask you, ladies, how many of you would receive those flowers? Now, some of you are like, I just like some flowers. Okay, that's okay. But you know, you'd be like, really? You, you, this isn't because you love me. You're programmed to do it. You have to do it. It's like someone showing up for mandatory AA meetings. You know, it's like you are court ordered to be there. There's not a choice. In the same way, if there's no choice, then there can't be love. Not true love. Not true love. God wants us to freely love him. And so if, 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 if you have the ability to choose love, you also have the ability to choose what? Hey, if you have the ability to choose right, you have the ability to choose what? Wrong. If you have the ability to choose good, you have the ability to choose what? Evil. And whenever we make those wrong choices, whenever we make the choices that are evil, that are not good, the Bible actually calls that sin. And sin always leads to suffering. It always leads to pain. Always. You say, well, I know a lot of people who do all kinds of crazy stuff and they seem to just get away with it and they seem to be fine. Let me tell you, just because what you see on the outside is happening doesn't mean that's a representation of what's going on on the inside. Because there's a whole lot of people who are struggling that pretend like life is, is, is grand. And see, sometimes we suffer from the sins of other people. Sometimes the pain and suffering that we experience come from the sins of others. Have you ever been stolen from? Have you been lied to? Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever been gossiped about? Have you ever been uh, told one thing and they did something else? Has anybody ever tried to take your life savings? 
You know what it is. You know what it's like to be sinned against. And to be honest, we know what it's like to sin because sometimes the suffering and pain that we go through are the result of our own sin. I think every one of us would admit that we've all made some mistakes, that we've all done some things and caused our own... Because sometimes our biggest enemy is enemy, right? Sometimes our biggest problem are, sometimes is, is us. Some of the biggest problems that I've had in my life are self-inflicted. Those wounds, but you know, not all of them are. Some of them come from other people. Some of them honestly come, and all of us have experienced sin. If you've lived in East Texas for less than 15 minutes, or more than 15 minutes, you have experienced this, this, the result of sin upon the creation and upon biology. See, in, in Genesis, God says he placed man and woman in the garden. It's perfect. There was no disease. And because there's no disease, there was no death. Man was meant to live forever. Human beings were designed for that. To live in continual fellowship with God. And he, but he gave them a choice, Adam and Eve. It's a choice. It's a choice to choose to love him or choose to reject him. A choice to obey him or, or to disobey him. And they chose wrongly. They chose to disobey. And as a result of that, all of humanity and all of creation fell. Because sin doesn't just affect us, it affects everybody around us. Somebody else's sin. When someone cheats you out of something, it doesn't just affect you, it affects your family, doesn't it? It affects all the people around you. So sin cascades and affected all of humanity. And so now death, destruction, disease enters the world. Now we know people who have cancer. Now we know people who died by COVID. Now we know people who have long COVID. Now we know people who have died. Now we have experienced, if you've lived here, you've experienced natural disasters, haven't you? Because we see the result of sin. This is the result of sin upon the earth. It's the result of wrong choices. It's the result of free will. Free will is the, ch the choice to love or to hate, to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And as a result, Adam and Eve has, the, the result of Adam and Eve has cost humanity enormously. Our first parents have done great damage. And so the question is, if God is all-knowing, then why in the world would he give us free will in the first place? Because he knew what was, we were going to do with it. He knew we would muck it up pretty bad. Why would he give this to us? Because God's primary virtue is love. He's love. He's love. And he prioritizes love above everything else. And so in order for us to receive God's love, and in order for us to love God back, then we have to have the choice to love, don't we? And the only way that God can take evil out of the world and suffering out of the world is to either take away our choice or to take away us, to remove us from the world. And God loves us enough where he's not going to do that. And so what I just told you is a great theological answer as to why bad things happen. So now we can all go eat chicken and go take a nap. Amen. It's a great theological answer if you're not suffering. But the minute you make it personal, it changes it, doesn't it? The minute it goes from, as, as, as soon as you, as soon as it goes from why is there suffering to why am I suffering? That's a completely different question, isn't it? Because we can, we can talk theology, we can talk about theoretical things as, about suffering, but when it is us that's going through pain, when we're the ones that are going through suffering, well, that's a different kind of question. And so why? Why are you? If you're going through suffering and pain today, why? I'm going to be very blunt and honest with you. I don't know why. I don't have the answer to that. But here's what I do know. I know that something better is coming. 
something better is coming. You see, suffering isn't the evidence that God doesn't love you, like a lot of people say. Years ago, I had to go to the chiropractor, I had a bad back, and he told me, he said, listen, we're going to be uh, cracking you a couple of days a week, and you are going to feel sore for a long time. You're going to be in pain for a long time. If you've ever been to the chiro- chiropractor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They just tell you f- up front, you're going to be in pain. Just, just know you're going to be in pain. I'm like, okay, okay. Now, did he put me into pain because he hated me? Did he put me in pain because he just loved me being in pain? Well, maybe not. I hope not. I hope he doesn't hate me. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the reason. He, no, he did it. Why? Because something better was coming. He could see that. If you've ever been in counseling, you know sometimes they go back and they talk about your childhood and they go back into some painful memories. And, and, they, and why do they do that? It's not to hurt you, it's to heal you. Because something better is coming. Something better. See, the presence of pain isn't a lack of love. Sometimes it's the evidence of love. The greatest example of this is Jesus. Jesus surrendered his glory in heaven he comes to earth he's born into a poor family he's mocked as a child because of the nature of his birth his mother is mocked they're made fun of they they the the psalmist actually says that they made songs up about her in the bar taverns and jesus was betrayed by friends he was abandoned by people who said they loved him and would never leave him. And Jesus was unjustly arrested. Jesus was beaten and tortured within an inch of his life. And Jesus was stripped naked and nailed to a cross and put on display for all to see. Not up on a hill, but up close. Right as you were walking alongside the road. Why? He left heaven for you and for me. He died for you and for me. And he did absolutely nothing wrong. If there was ever a case of someone of why do good things happen to bad or bad things happen to good people, Jesus was it. Because Jesus did it perfectly good. He never sinned. And yet, something bad happened. See, we can never ever say that Jesus doesn't understand our pain. We can never ever say that Jesus doesn't understand what we're going through. Jesus, you, you can never say, Jesus, you don't understand the pain in my body. Yes, he does. You don't understand what it's like to be hurt. Yes, he does. You don't understand what it's like to be abused. Yes, he does. You don't understand what it's like to be betrayed. Yes, he does. He knows all about it and even more. He gets it. He knows us. He knows exactly why. And yet he did it anyway. He was punished for our sake. So, because he knew that something better was coming what's that something better forgiveness for you and for me grace from God the grace of the Lord that can come to us that forgives us of our sins that washes like we sang this morning washes away in the blood of Jesus our sin and that gives us a new life and a new hope and makes us children of God sons and daughters of the most high God with a hope and a future in heaven that is a beautiful thing Jesus looked down and it was worth the punishment because he saw something better coming. That is the reason he went. And see, the father watched it all and he let it go on because he saw what was coming out of it. Because he loved you and loved me. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. He came to save us. He came to save us. And after living forever with, in direct connection with the Father on the cross, before He died, Jesus cries out in Matthew uh, 27, verse 46. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken It's the same cry of dereliction that we cry out when we go through pain and suffering and we say, God, why? Why am I going through this? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why don't you take this away from me? The same feeling that we have 
Jesus had on the cross. But you see, he saw, he saw what was coming, that something better was coming. See, I don't know why you're going through what you're going through, but I do know this. I know that he was willing to go through hell for you rather than be in heaven without you. You see, sometimes it takes a death to bring a resurrection. Sometimes it takes a a, a loss before a victory. Sometimes it takes a hurt before healing can happen. Sometimes it takes slavery and, and, and bondage before freedom can happen. And yet we cry out and we say, but God, I don't want to go through that. I want the resurrection without the death. I want the victory without the loss. See, in this life, one of the things that happens is we learn, we grow through pain and suffering more than anything else. Think about the great lessons that you've learned in life. Did you learn them by being successful? Did you learn them in the great victories of life that you've had? Did you learn them because you made straight A's? Or did you learn them when you almost flunked out? Or when you did flunk out? What great lessons did you learn? You learned them through suffering, through pain. Suffering is the great teacher, C.S. Lewis said. Suffering is the, great, is the megaphone that rouses a deaf world to call out to God. Suffering is the very thing. And so we may not always understand it. Yes, we have suffering in the world, but we know that God is good. And we know that God is powerful. And we know that God is able to take the evil and the suffering that are in the world and turn around and use it for good. Even when we don't understand it. He can bring good out of anything. And sometimes that's something better that's coming and we see it here in our lifetime and sometimes we see it in heaven. We may never know why something happens on this side of heaven, but we know that He loves us. Dostoevsky, the great Russian writer, said it this way. He said, I don't have the answer to the problem of evil, but I do know love. Jesus said it this way in John 16, 33. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We live in a world that is broken, but one day... God will come and He will establish a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more suffering. Revelation 21.4 says that after the earth is gone, God will establish a new heaven. And He says He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What's the old order of things? Death, disease, disaster, destruction. No more. It's gone. Gone forever. No more sickness. No more grief. No more heartache. No more depression. No more. No more crying yourself to sleep. No more anxiety. No more pain. No more suffering. No more starvation. No more war. No more. That's the promise of God. That's the problem. And while we are still here upon the earth, while we are still in this sin-sick world where love is a possibility, so is evil. And yet we are called to be ambassadors, people of the light, to go out into the world for God to do something, to take what was evil and use it for good. That's what Jesus said. He said, we don't um, overcome evil with evil. We overcome evil with what? Good. That's what you and I are called to be. How does suffering and pain get healed in this world? How, How do we help alleviate that in people's lives? You and I are part of the answer. Sometimes it's just coming up, not having the words, just listening. Sometimes... It's encouraging. Sometimes it's a ministry of presence. It's not always what you say. It's just the love that you show to other people. Sometimes it's just about being there. And we are called to be lights in the world, and that's the way it happens. We show up and we care about other people. We enter into their mess. We enter, we, for too long the church has run away from people in their mess. 
They go through bankruptcy and they disappear because they're ashamed. They go through divorce and they disappear because they're ashamed. They go through loss and they disappear for, for a month, two months, three months because they, they, they're, they're, they're broken. And, and the church, our call as the people of God is to go to the people in the midst of their mess and bring the message of Jesus that sometimes we use words, but a lot of times we just use love. Just love. That's the answer. See, we're not uh, trying to avoid it. Christians are not avoiding the, the, the question of suffering. In fact, the Bible talks about suffering all the time. All throughout the Bible, we see suffering. People suffer. The Bible doesn't avoid it. It's not a book of fairy tales. We see in the Old Testament, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he weeps over the suffering that's happening in the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, John the Baptist, who, whom Jesus said was one of the greatest men who ever lived. John the Baptist was in prison and he was questioning God. My favorite, of course, is King David. David was called a man after God's own heart and yet in Psalm 13, verse 2, he said, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul and sorrow in my heart every day? All the great people in the Bible struggled with suffering. And it's okay to struggle. It's okay to struggle with suffering. It's okay to question God because God is big enough to, to handle our questions. But here's the key. Keep your focus on Him. Keep your focus on the Lord. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep getting in His Word. Keep showing up with His people. I read yesterday about Steve Jobs, the, the founder of Apple. He grew up Lutheran, and he went to Sunday school every single week. And when he, in the 60s, when he was 13 years old, he went, he saw a, an article in Time magazine about suffering in Africa, starvation, children suffering. So he ripped the page out of Time Magazine and he took it to his pastor and he said, I'm trying to reconcile what I'm hearing in Sunday school about the God of Sunday school and a God who sees this. Does God see this happening? And the pastor gave an answer similar to kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier. It was insufficient. Now for most 13 year olds it might have been sufficient but for someone of Steve Jobs' intellect very insufficient. And Walter Isaacson, his biographer, said he ditched his faith and he never returned to church again for the rest of his life. That's why it's important to keep showing up. That's why it's important, yes, that we know the theological answer, but we also know, and I don't want to make theology not practical, but it's, we also know the practical answer that sometimes it's just about being there for people. And when they're ready to hear the theological answer, we can explain it. But it begins with our ministry of presence and love. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep focused. Remember Asaph, our poor schlub in Psalm 73 who was going through all kinds of trouble and seeing all kinds of turmoil, seeing the wicked prosper, and seeing so many people suffer. Listen to how... He ended his psalm, verse 16, he switches gears and he says, when I tried to understand all this, all the suffering that he saw, it troubled me deeply. I want you to notice what he says next, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood, he's talking about the wicked here, their final destiny. He's saying, I was going through some stuff and I didn't understand it and I was suffering. But when I entered into the presence of God, when I saw his goodness, it was his strength that was restored to me. I was restored. I was restored in my spirit. In verse 26, he says that even though I'm going through some stuff, I'm paraphrasing, even though I'm going through some things, my strength is from the Lord and he is my portion. That's it. The Bible doesn't say that we're not going to suffer, but we keep our focus on God. This week, um, 
one of our day school parents, they have a, a three-year-old boy in uh, the three-year-olds, obviously. Um, they have a, a newborn baby, and uh, the newborn baby passed away, six-month-old. And I called the family to give them my condolences and sympathies and tell them that we were, as a church, praying for them. And I just said, you know, I don't have the answers. I don't understand why this happened. But here's what I know. I know that God is good. And I know that he loves us. And the, the mom said, Amen. We know that too. And when I was, I've told the two morning services that story. And after the second service, a lady came up to me. It's an older lady. And she said, I want you to give my number to this mom. And she can call me any day, any time of night, to cry or to talk, or whatever she needs. She said, I had a baby that was stillborn. I know what it's like. And I thought, this is what it means to be the church. To look at one another and say, I know. I know what it's like. I've been there. I've been through what you've been through. I've suffered as you suffered. And to support one another through it. This woman who's much older, has daughters, has grandkids of her own now, is able to say, listen, there's a hope and there's a future. Something better is coming. Whatever you're going through. You may be like, Phil, I'm having a great day. I'm having a great week great life, everything's fantastic and you kind of brought me down this morning about all this suffering, listen that's, I'm sorry to bring you down but you know what, we're either coming out of suffering, in the middle of suffering, or one really bad decision away from suffering but whatever you're going through, or will go through I want you to know that one day you'll look back and say, God is good I wouldn't want to go through it again. But he brought me through it to bring me to this. Something better is coming. Let's pray together. Oh Lord God. I think about the people in this room this morning. And I think about the loss that they've been through. What they've gone through in this last year, the last two years. This is a message for them. And I pray, Lord, that what we don't understand, we will surrender to you. And we'll trust you, that you love us, and that you're good. And we trust you that tomorrow, whether that tomorrow is on this earth or later, something better is coming. We claim this and pray this in Jesus' holy and wonderful name. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and let's worship together.